Carrion Up the Defra. Not an Ealing comedy, but a cartoon guide to help you understand the joke that is the general licenses. Staying on general licenses, information is power. We have a questionnaire we'd like you all to fill in, please, to help Defra get the message. Also in the show, learn some technique. Browning brings rifle skills to UK gun shop owners via Andrew Venables at WMS Firearms Training. And Ben's back. Everything you want to know about shooting shotguns. We have a new series of smoking targets and we start with his pre-shoot routine. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Hundreds and thousands enjoy their shooting. We can't have that, says a man called Chris. Protecting crops and managing wildlife. I'll see my buddy Michael. Have a chat about this. They've swept away 200 years of laws evolved by us, where birds are protected when we reckon they're rare, and replaced them with a ban called the General Licenses. A ban that doesn't work, but makes it look like they care. The old general licences were fairly pointless. They reminded all the shooters that the government's in charge. The new ones are dangerous. You can only shoot pigeons a couple of months a year when they're nesting. You can only shoot pigeons while crops are actually growing, not before you sow. You have to scare crows off birds' nests in a manner that doesn't scare nesting birds. You have to prove crop damage, if necessary, in front of a judge. You have to move scarecrows every day and prove you have done that. You can't shoot on or near triple SIs. That's a ban on around 15% of England's landmass, turning triple SIs into a songbird snack bar for crows and magpies. You can shoot a pigeon, but you can't shoot it to eat it. You are no longer allowed to decide for yourself whether there are too many birds on your ground, not enough birds or about the right amount, and what to do about it. That's up to judges in a court of law, advised by the RSPB. <laughs> The EC Birds Directive was thought up in a tower block. The UK's general licences followed suit. The Wildlife and Countryside Act worked fine. It listed the birds we agree you can't shoot. So sweep away these layers of pointless regulation that are aimed at giving him a job and banning you. Sweep away the bureaucrats and the RSPB bureaucrats and please, while you're doing that, Chris and Michael too. I hope that helps. Now we need your help. We have compiled a five minute survey about the general licences to help DEFRA understand and we'd like you, the Field Sports Channel viewers, to fill it out. Link is appearing on the screen. There are also some questions about our website, which is how we communicate with you. The best way to improve that. Please fill in and share, which is something that David knows about next on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The general licences shambles continues to get worse. Though speaking to the BBC, the new chairman of Natural England, Tony Juniper, says the general licences is not a shambles and instead complaining farmers are confused. His comments did not endear him to farmers. This lamb on a Northumberland farm was sent in by Lisa Bowring. Well, this is for people who don't understand why carrion crows need to be controlled. I'm lambing at the moment, and this is just a daily occurrence. This is from a carrion crow. Now, dead lambs don't bleed. This is probably seen off the, uh, the young lamb, to be honest, and this one as well. But there's many, many more throughout the day. This is this is just not uh, this is just not the only two this morning. This is I'm just showing you this as an, as an example. In the latest round, Defra is rushing through a consultation on the shooting of pest species in the UK. The deadline is this Monday, 13th of May at 5 p.m. All pest controllers are urged to visit the Defra website. Plus, fill out our survey. Plus, fill out Basque's survey. 
Basque will submit evidence showing the importance of pest control. We will submit evidence showing how many people enjoy pigeon shooting. So it's worth doing all three. Details are on our general licenses page, F channel forward slash general licenses. These images, again sent in by Lisa Bowring, are of a schoolgirl's runner ducks from Yorkshire, attacked and killed by a carrion crow that, at the time, she was unable to stop. DEFRA have assumed responsibility for general licences and also opened a call for evidence with a really short timescale. And this will help inform them over what they do with general licences. So it's super important that you engage. The second thing you need to do is respond to a Basque survey. There's structured questions there which will enable us to give a very strong, powerful response to DEFRA. There are fears that Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland could soon follow England into the general licences chaos. Chris Packham has called on his social media followers to lobby Scottish Natural Heritage, Natural Resources Wales and DERA NI. SNH Chairman Mike Cantlay says he's already had death threats from animal rights activists. Shooters are taking their grievances to London. Organisers of the Countryside Rally 2019 set for the end of June have hit 43,544 sign-ups on their Facebook group. For more on that, including how to sign up, go to F channel forward slash Countryside Rally 2019. Hares could get their own shooting season in the UK. Former Tory Agricultural Minister George Eustace is introducing a private members bill that will make it illegal to shoot hares from February to September. Although unlikely to become law this year, he's using the publicity to cite a figure of 300,000 hares shot per year, provided by animal rights organisation Born Free Foundation, which ignores the positive work shooters do keeping down Corvid numbers, the biggest predator of leverets. The UK will not ban trophy imports. Despite huge pressure from aunties and their celebrity friends, Environment Minister Michael Gove says it's better to let African and other countries make up their own minds about their wildlife. Police have decided to take no further action against masked saboteurs who beat up a huntsman and a landowner in Essex. Here we see sabs in black balaclavas beating and kicking huntsman Gary Thorpe and a local landowner. Gary says he was punched in the face twice by this man when he asked the thugs to leave a private drive. 17 SABs were arrested on the day, but released without charge. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association has welcomed a new report on predator control on moorland. It shows that when gamekeepers control abundant predators during the Langham Moor demonstration project, red-listed curlew numbers rose 10% a year and golden plover populations rose 16%. Here's SGA Chairman Alex Hogg. And this is due to predator control, not habitat. They keep shouting habitat, habitat. Without the predator control, we wouldn't have seen these numbers increasing. What we need is the habitat and the predator control working together. This will give us a golden ticket for our waders. The Northern Shooting Show is taking place this weekend. As well as the usual trade stands, some of our guys will be there too. Look out for Kai, who's serving up game from the flames, and Roger Late, who'll be manning the HFT Masters course. Scottish firefighters are taking lessons from gamekeepers on how to manage moorland wildfires. In this picture, headkeeper Ion Hepburn and station officer Alex McKinley of the Scottish Fire Service carry out controlled burning on the Dunmaglas estate. Burning also forces heather to regenerate, which is good for upland birds. Shopkeepers in Reading have become deer managers. A munchak turned up in the Oracle shopping centre in Reading. Staff drove it into one of the stores where they caught it and later released it. French farmers are becoming increasingly angry about wolf attacks on livestock. Last week a farmer found six sheep and 16 lambs dead in a field in Aquitaine in the centre of the country. Keen to play down wolf attacks, local authorities would only concede it was done by a big canine. Wolves were recently reintroduced to the area. Google doesn't allow gun or ammunition ads, but it says that hunting ads are fine. Google's animal cruelty prohibition does not apply to hunting ads, says a Google spokeswoman. She explained how this Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation video ad was mistakenly rejected in April, then allowed following protests by two United States senators. Google states it doesn't have a policy prohibiting hunting ads, but they do have a policy against ads that promote animal cruelty 
or feature gratuitous violence towards animals. And finally, has the Indian army hunted down a yeti? It claims to have spotted footprints belonging to the abominable snowman or yeti, the Sherpa word for wild man. Himalayan legend tells of a fierce creature who lives in the mountains of northern India, Tibet and Nepal. Now an Indian army unit has photographed the latest outsized footprints in the snow that may or may not prove it. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And if you want to see more news, go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, which we like to keep up to date. Now for our continental viewers, David has asked me to flag up his filmmaking course, which is on in Rotterdam next Friday, the 17th of May, in conjunction with the Dutch Weidmans Heil magazine. It's in English, David isn't Eddie Izzard, uh, uh, but there are a couple of places still left. So go to the link on the screen to find out about that. Next up, a continental company, Browning from Belgium, brought its shiny new rifles to the wide open spaces of Wales. Want to see some shiny new guns? We're up in windy Wales with WMS Firearms Training as European gun making giant Browning gives its dealers a day testing its new range of Browning and Winchester rifles on the range. Here we are in the calm before the storm. We've got a day with Browning, with Browning and Winchester products and kite scopes and optics. The weather's decent, forecast some showers later on. And it's looking good, everything's zeroed, everything's set up. Nut, drag it back, shove it forward and it will cycle. Top tank safety catch, so we've all seen that. The whole idea is to get some uh, key dealers for us together, uh, no matter if they are experienced or not, because the whole idea is to, to, to make them uh, more comfortable with our rifles and then to show them what, you, what they, they could do with a bit of good habits and, uh, and techniques uh, to shoot uh, at a different distance. So we will uh, soon go to the thousand yards and uh, I'm pretty sure all of them will get uh, sufficient knowledge and, uh, and uh, confidence in the rifle and the scopes to, to, to hit the target. This one is the new x -Bolt Pro version that we launched this year. You see that everything is uh, Cerakoted, grey Cerakoted. So we, we proceed what we call the barrel lapping. So this is something that is done normally only uh, for custom uh, rifles. So it's a hand uh, b b lapping after the, the, the barrel has been made. Andrew says the keystone to accurate shooting is achieving the perfect mount. If you take your chin, you put your chin on top as if you're going to go to sleep, and then you run your jawbone down the side of the rifle and then stop when a perfect picture appears. I've now got reasonable contact with the stock. You can see it's just pushing my chubby cheeks off a little bit um, and I've got a reasonable shooting position. Once the trigger finger goes in there, you don't want it wrapped round like that. You don't want it petting up the side like that. You want the centre of the pad of your finger on the trigger. Breathe in. The sight should go down, breathe out they should come back to where they started if the position's pointing naturally. Finger to the trigger, take up a little bit of pressure, you can see I'm on the trigger now, there's a bit of pressure, squeeze it and the shot will break. Okay, lovely triggers on these, absolutely gorgeous. Back into it, it's a systematic way of doing it, into your shoulder, quick check, onto the stock, perfect picture, gentle release and then into the reload. You're going to learn about wind, learn about shooting, well, about all sorts, really. You are the hitting the lower right hand arm of the A. Andrew's coaching aims to improve your marksmanship, and after years of doing it, he reckons he hits the mark with it. We start on the 2 2 rifles always because that gives them all of the best methods and principles for rifle shooting to make that switch on the centre fires. With the 2 2, there's no recoil, there's hardly any bank at all. It's just a gentle thing to shoot, and all your focus can be on learning, there's no distractions. Even with the moderators on the centre fires, as the recoil increases, as the noise increases, you start to get a situation where people are then in fuzzy focus in terms of learning. Always learn on the small stuff. Air guns, 2-2s, 17 HMR is brilliant. If you fire about 100 rounds in a rimfire or an air gun, for every one round you fire in a centre fire, you'll be a very good shot.
you're well, half an inch above the ball. The team moves on to 243s, 308s and some heftier Argali steel. Though not necessarily big recoilers, moving up to centrefires is where flinch can become a problem for both novice and experienced shooters. We don't want this, and then backing away. We want the shot fired, followed through, watch it land, and then reload. So just two more that labour the point, if the point needs labouring. Because that is a very common thing, isn't it? I bet you must see that all the time, as people blinking when they take a shot. I do it. When I shoot big rifles, yeah. it starts to overwhelm me, and I've got to focus really hard. You know, I'm meant to be dead hard Andrew Venables. I'm not at all. I get battered like everybody else does. And I've had a broken shoulder, which has affected me most of my life. So I've got to focus on making the shot. I'm setting everything up. I'm getting the breathing sorted out. I'm dialing out the flinch, and then I'm making the shot. I can't do it all day, but I can do it for the shot that matters. And again, the secret is to practice with little stuff. And then when you shoot the big rifles, only fire one or two shots. And if they're in the right place, give up and have a cup of tea. And you can see I'm not blinking, my eyes open the whole time, I see the bullet land. And when you reload, keep looking through the scope. Don't break the position. Practice, practice, practice. And if you've got a large rifle with a heavy recoil that's expensive to shoot, practice a lot with a little rifle and shoot the large rifle sparingly but extremely well. That's lovely. Yeah. Spotting. Okay. Same spot. Moving out to 200 metres with the Xbolt Pros and Winchester XPRs, this is where the manufacturer starts to get honest feedback. The dealers are our eyes and ears, they feed back to us what's needed in the marketplace and hopefully we can adapt our product offering to match that need. It's, it's continuous development, obviously. The range is expanding, we continue developing and obviously working on the future of the range as well. Uh, so this kind of first feedback, it's, it's very, very good for us to know the small things we could improve, those small things that are actually very appreciated and things like that. So feedback is always good to have. It's always been a bone of contention with the older Browning rifles because we sell, sell the majority of our rifles in America. That doesn't always suit the European market because the trigger pulls are very heavy on American rifles compared to European. Um, they have to pass a Sammy drop test, they literally drop a rifle and it, it mustn't go off so the triggers are, are much stiffer. In Europe the, the, sort of the, the modern trend is to have a very light trigger. So we've adapted the European rifles uh, and the X-Bolt range now has what we call an SF trigger which is a super feather trigger which is already set at a very low level, below three pound trigger pull. So that suits most people. Uh, so that's the main difference between American and, and European rifles now. Now for the real distance test. Members of the team try their hands at a blustery 1,000 yard firing point. At this sort of range, air density, everything matters. Air temperature, the whole lot does. If we were making tactical solutions on this, I'd probably have an anemometer out. I'd have a Kestrel stuck up in the air and I'd be measuring and measuring. But we're having to go with a hunting rifle. Okay, it's a bit of a tactical hunting rifle, but it's a hunting scope, certainly. Now, I want you to see what the wind's doing. So we are deliberately and shamelessly not going to adjust for the wind. So instead of you shooting down there thinking, that's amazing, it just hits the pig, you're going to have to aim off. I'm pretty sure everybody will hit the target with armor teal, which is not uh, the most expensive one of the world, with the hit the target a thousand yards, which is quite a distance. It's not a distance that you, 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 you will shoot for hunting, because the whole stuff is to get in closer, of course, uh, but it shows the, the, the quality uh, of, our, of our material, both rifles and, and scopes, and, uh, and, and the combo works well together. Okay. Do you think two, to three, two disc widths right at that disc? I, I personally would aim about a disc or two to the right of the smiley face, to the right of the pig. See what happens. Right, 
Right, if you start it off, Paul, and we'll sequence the shots between you, so there's always something happening. Five rounds and pray. Okay. Spotting. That's the face. Above the peg. Reload. Quick, get the next shot off. Right, now Paul, use your aim off. Spot it in. One foot to the left of the head. Hit. You hit the bottom of his mouth. Hit. To the left of it again. But. Oh, look, you're really serious. Yeah. Hit. Yeah. You can hear them clanging, can't you? Yeah. Awesome. Over the course of the next hour, they all managed to score hits at a thousand yards. They had to dial in and aim off. Knowing how far to aim off is a bit of a big eye. I suppose I was just lucky, the first time ever, and getting five on the board, yeah, it was pretty good. This look on the face of a first time thousand yard shot is the most satisfying part of the day for Andrew. What better way to round it all off than a quick round of pig bashing with, as it happens, a quick loading rifle. It's, it's good fun because we'll shoot the Morale, which is a linear repeating gun, which is uh, sold very well all over Europe for driven hunts, but also stalking. So it's kind of a hybrid gun. We have 10 round magazines. So it, if you're able to shoot the 10 rounds on the wild boar in such a short distance, then you're good to go for driven hunts. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we'll see. What's, who's the money on for being able uh, to do that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I won't tell on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. That was a really good hit, we like that one, that's a hard shot. It's on half speed at the moment, we've got a 50 metre track so you've got a fair quick crack at it. It's possible to get two or three shots off in one pass, unless it's on high speed, 30 kph is quite quick. A little bit behind on the cheek. The secrets are being smooth. If you point your finger down the fore end, you'll naturally point at the target, just like with a shotgun. And when you've mounted on it, just keep moving, bang, and all the way back, bang. You're not slowing down, you're not stopping, you're not swinging faster. It's just sustained lead. At this speed, we're going on the cheek of a relatively small pig to get it at 70 meters. Just on the nose. Uh, to be honest, on this one, the best caliber to do it with is a 1.7 HMR because it's doing two and a half thousand feet per second. The lead is the same as most center fire rifles and it's obviously great fun and gentle to shoot at this range and cheaper. So when we have groups up for practicing before going to Poland or Hungary or Turkey or somewhere, we'll normally start with a 1.7 HMR if they're complete novices and get them shooting with that. Practicing this with a 9.3x74 or a 9.3x62 is expensive and bruising. So get it right with the little rifle and then again, a few shots with a big one at each speed, nail the lead and it's all good. Good! We've had a lovely day up here with Browning and Winchester at WMS. We started off the day three complete novices and actually during the day none of the 13 people involved had ever shot a driven boar target before. And this is what happens when you give people who've had good tuition a Browning morale and you get them to shoot a running boar target. They've shot it to bits. Well done team. This has actually been resprayed twice. For more about Browning's range of Winchester and Browning rifles, go to browning.eu. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Browning. And with the clay shooting season now well underway, we're off with Ben Husthwaite and Game Ball and the new series of Smoking Targets.
So welcome back to uh, Field Sports Brit Smoking Targets. Here for another episode, I think we're going to do another five. We um, put it out on social media, ask for your opinions on what actually this time, what you guys wanted to see instead of me just reeling off what I wanted to see. So um, we've picked the top five. I've got a good friend and student of mine, James, with me here today to uh, be the crash test dummy, try and put him through his paces. We're going to start off with uh, quite an interesting one for me, the pre-shot routine. It crops up a lot, Ben, why do I miss my last pair? Ben, why do I hit the first pair and then my scores go downhill? And a lot of that becomes down to the mental game and the mental side of things, being the pre-shot routine. Um, a good friend of mine, um, Anthony Matarita in America, said it very well. What happens is you tend to get careless or careful. So something what I want to try and do is take care of the brain waves and the thought process from calling pull to shoot in a pair and then call in pull again. We're going to try and control all of that time. It takes somewhere between 7 to 11 seconds to complete, depending on the person. But what that pre-shot routine should do is take the same amount of time, regardless of the presentation you're faced with, regardless of the difficulty levels, your routine should just stay the same. So I'm going to walk James through the process first, let him get a little bit accustomed to it. Then we'll be bringing in the stopwatch, timing him and seeing just how specific he is with with the routine and how he feels oh. it helps him or it may not help him but you know we're going to get his honest feedback as well if you shoot a couple of pairs for me now mm -hmm. just exactly as you normally would without a routine okay. just just shoot the pair for me i'm going to show you them and let, let's see what happens in the cage okay, okay. your first bird's going to come from the from the left side here and on report out of this shed here from the right okay on your call Paul. Oh. Bang. Bang. So let's just see two pairs in your own time exactly as you normally would. Ball. Ball. When you were loading the gun between the pairs, what was going on in your head? Uh, I was thinking about me uh, where, where I saw it best to kill, so yeah. my kill point. Uh, obviously, viewpoints both are at the sheds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was holding out in between, um, and then I was thinking about what lead I was going to apply to each target. So quite a lot of information that James is trying to feed into himself in, in a very short space of time. But the moment we get any downtime is when that little noise on your shoulder starts talking to you. You could straight this peg. If I hit this next pair, I get a personal best. Oh my God, I've missed the first pair. I'm going to miss the rest. I'm going to look stupid in front of the people that are watching. Oh my God, I don't want to get out of here. And what we're going to try and do is eliminate that process. So what I want to try and do now, James, is work on, uh, on a pre-shot routine. Okay. It's going to be seven steps. So what we're going to do, the first step, when we load the first cartridge yep. into the gun, that's going to be an instruction time for bird number one. Okay. Now, for me, the three things that could to have correct to break a target is method, speed, and lead. They're gonna be the three things we, we're concentrating on. When we load that first shell in, I want you to pick two of those three that you think's the best two to help you on this specific target. So we've got a semi-quartering bird here, it's not too fast. So for me, my instructions would be, start behind it, very slow hands. There's two instructions gonna help me break that bird. When I load my second cartridge into the gun, we do the exact same process for the second bird. So again, for me, it's a lot faster crosser. Uh -huh. So my, my two instructions are gonna be go to it. That's gonna make me shoot a pull away method. And I want to see two feet of lead. So I've now loaded two instructions for the second bird. If we just pull the safety on while waving the gun around, if you just close the gun for me into a low position. By low, I mean out the way yeah. of your eyesight. At this point here, I want you to spend a short amount of time staring at your second hold point. Okay. When we're comfortable there, the gun goes straight to hold point one, eyes to view point one, and we're gonna call pull immediately. Okay? okay? Just unload. What I want you to do this time is run through the same routine by yourself. Again, I want you to give me the instructions out loud. Okay. But when you get to the pull, we're just gonna open the gun and start again, okay? Just so you get you settled in the routine. And you're ready. Okay, so first cartridge is going in. Yeah. 
What's your instructions for the bird? I'm going to shoot swing through on it. Okay. So I'm going to start just behind it. Yeah. And just swing through. Uh, slow hands on yeah, that. Yes. So make sure we use two out of the three instructions. Yeah, yeah. For the second bird, the crosser, I'm going to get onto the bird. Yep. Yeah. And then I'm going to pull away. I'm going to pull away to like a, a predetermined lead. Yeah, that's it. So the, there's two out of three again. So we're using two out of three instructions. Shell into the gun. Closing the gun. Slow, staring at your second hold point. Hold point one, view point one, and we're going to go. Okay, unload again, and this time we're live. Oh. Beautiful moves. Oh. Beautiful, well done. Now, I know the viewers won't be able to see this, but um, when James shot his first two pairs, when there was no routine, yeah. it was kill, loss, kill, loss. Yeah, yeah. And that was four out of four. Now, I'm not saying that's predominantly down to the routine, of course, but what did that feel like in your head? A lot better. Well, for a start, when I shot them the way I wanted to shoot, I shot the second bird swing through. And like you say, I, I missed it. Yeah. I missed both birds. Then I got onto the bird, stayed with it for probably 20%. Maybe thirty percent of its, its path, and then uh, it resulted in two kills. But what happened in your head when you were loading? Do you feel well, rushed? No, because I had no time to think about anything else apart from the instructions that I was giving that's, myself for those birds. That's why I impose this pre-shot routine onto people: is to simply eliminate any downtime. Whether you're in C class and you're on for your first straight, or whether you've got to hit the last four targets to become world champion, you, you can't tell somebody not to think about it. If I say to you, don't think about a pink elephant, the first thing you think about is a pink elephant. You can't, you know, you can't unknow what you already know. If you know you're on for a straight on a stand, you can't unknow that. You have to learn to deal with that. So what I want to do now, I know it's quite quick and we're doing this in a short segment, but what I'm going to do now is actually put you to the test okay. and time you. Right. And let's see how consistent your routine is. Now, before we do that, if I can just step in, I just want to yep. talk the viewers through a couple of variables that can happen. So say, for instance, I run safeties on again for safety. If I go through the full routine, I close the gun, I get back to my hold point, I call pull, and the referee says no bird. I open the gun, and I'm left with the information still loaded. So I'm not going to st start from here. My routine would start with a close of the gun, staring at the second hold point, view, hold point one, view point one, pull. Now, the other variable is this. I run the routine, I do it all perfectly, pull, bang, no bird. I open the gun and I'm now left with this. One of the cartridges is missing. The routine has been broken. This shell comes out. Of course, it's a game ball shell. 28 years, it will never be anything else. That goes into the bottom barrel. That becomes my first instruction. The second instruction goes in. I close the gun, stare at my second hole point. Hole point one, view point one, and pull the whole routine starts from the beginning. So they're the only two variables. I may throw a couple of those in as we go and, and see how James reacts to them. So just wanted to make sure we were clear on them because they're things that are going to happen to you when you're out on the range. So James, let me just get the uh, the stopwatch ready here. So why is, why do we need a stopwatch, Ben? When I do this with students, what can happen a lot is you tend to see a variable. So he may well be 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 14 seconds. That will tell me that on that last pair, something happened. Something else got in, into his mind and that could result in a miss. What I want James to do and all of my students is to be pretty consistent throughout any variable hits or misses or you know again if it's a hard bird or a soft bird i want to make sure that his routine is holding firm and making sure that when he gets that hard bird, he's not overthinking that or putting something else in or taking something out as well he could get to four seconds because he's panicking he's no he's missed two pairs he's shooting on a squad of people that are watching him and he's like oh, get me out of here so he speeds up the routine, but then he looks back at the scoreboard when he gets to the clubhouse and he was two off winning the shoot in his class. Just that panic set in. So it's just about being structured and consistent in the routine. Oh.
Ten point seven. Eleven point two. Oh. And ten point six on the last one. So again, as far as I'm concerned, that's very consistent. We're not going to be looking to be within a hundredth of a second because there is things that can go wrong. We can pull a cartridge out the wrong way. It comes out brass first or plastic first. Then we have to turn it round. So there is a little bit of variables in there. How did that feel there? That's the first time we've shot a sequence of them. Yeah, that felt really good, yeah. Um, again, going back to, there's just, there's, there's no time to think about anything else apart from the bird you have killed. Yeah, it, it's a struggle to get an inlet. There's, yeah. there, there's no, there's no downtime is how I describe it to people. There's no downtime for you to start letting that little man on your shoulder start to That's give it. you the, um, the poor information or the nerve wracking information that you're about to deal with. So many people waste so much time and energy trying to not think about something that that actually, I find it's easier to think about it. And then when I enter the cage, I turbo up to 100% and I use the pre-shot routine to, uh, to, to, fix, to fix those problems. So for me, that's a little segment on your pre-shot routine and I hope that helps. It's a, it's a very generic pre-shot routine. If we were working together and in a few weeks time, we'll try to make this a little bit more personal to James because there'll be things that he needs that I don't need, things that you need that he doesn't need. So it, it will move on to be personal. But for right now, hopefully that helps you out. Can I throw in a question? Yeah, carry on. Is there a concern that people get in such a kerfuffle that they're thinking about what was my pre-shot, what am I supposed to be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. But one thing you do, if you're at home, all you need is two snap caps, two empty shells, visualize two targets if i can just step into it and i can practice this routine at home for free so in my head i visualize a slow rabbit about 30 yards that i know wants no lead and a big fast batu coming in from the left i just need to visualize those so i work my routine very very slow hands connect to the rabbit fast pull away on the second bird closing my gun staring at my second hole point for that rabbit first hole point viewpoint pull and I can just run the routine for free until it becomes actually ingrained. I don't have to spend money out on the range learning it. I can actually learn it for free in the house. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Game Ball. And thank you, Sporting Targets Playground in Bedfordshire for the stands in the middle of that piece. And we'll be hearing more from Ben and Smoking Targets over the next few weeks. Now, from Bedfordshire to the wider world of hunting and shooting, on YouTube it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. The film of the week on YouTube is Mum, Dad, a boy called Tommy and a girl called Ruby going pig hunting as a family, Australian style. It's boar hunting with my kids, what a great day out. For lovers of big landscapes and dramatic adventure, Browning has put its weight behind Irishman Alberto Rizzini, okay, Irish-Italian man, going hunting in Kazakhstan. The film premiered this afternoon on YouTube. More Irish on the move, Norman Mulvaney from Irish Safaris Hunting sends me part one of his latest safari where he is after zebra and caracal in South Africa's Eastern Cape. Catapult Carnage brings out catch and cook squirrel and pigeon kayak slingshot adventure. Liam gets a pigeon and a squirrel. Tommy from rural pest control Whitwell is out night rabbit shooting with Browning T-Bolt in 2-2 and ticker T1 in 17 HMR. He sends me this video. This is German hunting sensation Hunter Brothers last hunt video from the 2018-2019 season. It is a driven day in the Eiffel, a low mountain range on the border of Germany and Belgium. Vukashin Pelevich from the Wild Serbia channel has started stalking Robux, filmed near the border of Bulgaria. He has some luck. And finally, staying in Serbia, Jovan and Shradan from the Lov i Ribolov channel are on a pheasant and hare hunt, a walked up day, part of a series that goes out on Serbian TV on Mondays and Thursdays. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week from the rather gloomy 
weather of the UK, the rather gloomy mood of England over the general licenses. Let's hope we get some resolution on that next week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, and of course you can pop your email address into our constant contact form at the bottom of the page. And we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, it's at 7pm UK time every Wednesday, and you can back us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares to find out about that. And I will see you next week. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.